The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Tuesday, December 28th, 2021, and the slowly slipping away 2021. This is special programming by The Majority Report. My Good name riddance. is Sam Cedar. Here with Emma Vigeland as we say goodbye to the disaster that 2021 was. Mm. Really, actually, I sort of feel like it's been like that for almost two decades now. Um, it's never ending. But the year is going to end, ladies and gentlemen. That's why we're looking back on this year. The only, only bright spots of the year were, of course, from 12 noon Eastern to approximately 2.30 Eastern, Monday through Friday, as uh, the Majority Report was on. That's the That's only... It. Every every other moment of 2021, except for those 15 hours a week, right? I don't know. I'm bad at math. Uh, approximately Five. 15 hours. Because I, I assume people... Five, 10, that's it's like 12 and a half. Yeah, well, they bask in the... the they, 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 people are still having to glow right. at 2.30... Then it lasts until 3 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, and like the extra minutes that uh, yeah. that you add on to the end of the show could probably constitute a few more hours. That's possible. Mm-hmm. I mean, to be honest, when we started this show, it was an hour and a half. It's just sort of, there's been mission creep. <laughs> Honestly, the, 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 the fun half was, the free half was 45 minutes and the fun half was 45 minutes. And somehow it just kept getting larger and larger. That does seem too short. Like yeah, the right? initial, yeah. yeah. Um. Anyways, uh, today is a best of uh, show, and on the show, we have a lot of great in- content for you. We're really <sighs> going above and beyond for you folks. We just had so much that was best. First off, we have Clint Smith, author of How the Word is Passed, A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America. This is um, Legacies, really talks a lot about... Um, the 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 statues and the symbolism and the 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 way that we as a country essentially whitewash our history Mm. fascinating look into this and then we also did an interview with annette gordon reed about uh america's long journey to recognizing juneteenth she wrote a book called on juneteenth and um it's our way of bringing a little sunshine in uh december juneteenth well, yes. Now it's been it's been uh, recognized as well, too. So it's by, also the first year that it became a federal holiday. By Biden, you're right. And also because it's like we just give. This is the giving season. We give, 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 and give. Jason Miles. Ooh. Jason Miles came on the show. He is um, one of the hosts of This Is Revolution. He's awesome. And he had just a great piece about music and sort of it was gen x-y a little bit and um and and he came on we had just a great conversation just a really great writer great thinker um the and and this is you know sort of like socio-political would you say is that cultural yeah sort of mapping his uh observations about how the music industry the punk scene developed and how that sort of maps onto the left wing scene is yeah, yeah, it was nuts how he he wrapped that around. I thought the the whole thing was fascinating. It's a fascinating piece. Um, so all three of those interviews today, enjoy them all. I hope that uh, you're you know people are having you know fun or whatever it is that people do this time of year. I don't know. Yeah, I got family, my kids family back. Family time, today. maybe. Yeah, I got my kids back today, so I know with the kids, and so they're probably readjusting to each other, and and me with the kids, and. So enjoy this and uh, join us tomorrow where we're going to be talking to, uh, this was just sort of a coincidence, uh, Jason Miles, a co-host on uh, This Is Revolution, Pascal Robert, who uh, gives a great history of of Haiti and uh, neocolonialism. And it happened essentially in the wake of the uh, Moise assassination Mm. in Haiti. Our relationship with Haiti is, um, well, we'll talk about it tomorrow. So, folks, enjoy these three interviews and uh, join us tomorrow. Hey, folks, today's uh, episode brought to you by SunsetLakeSabadeh.com. It is um, one of our favorite sponsors. They're movement partners. They've got great products. 
tremendous amount of integrity. They use integrated pest management, no pesticides. They use um, they use organic. Um, what do you call it? What's the stuff they use to uh, make stuff grow? Fertilizer. Um, their their product is um, tested out by third parties. They use uh, regenerative farming practices in conjunction with the University of Vermont and fans of the show. So the coupon code is left is best. You get 20% off. You get 20% off the Sebede Day Fudge. Oof. You get 20% off. <laughs> I know it. The gummy bears. Oof. You get 20% off the coffee, the tincture, the tincture with melatonin. You get it off the smokables. Matt grinds up some of their smokables and mix it to, with other non sebede stuff. Smalls, you don't even need to take off the stems. There you go. You also uh, have pre-rolls. Um, they have uh, Salve with Arnica. Just all sorts of great products, and they're a great company. They have donated uh, thousands of dollars to all of the... Um, uh, the movement causes that you care about, strike funds, food pantries, uh, giving money directly to people living in extreme poverty, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Just a great company, great product. Do yourself a favor, sunsetlakesebede.com. Use the code left is best. You will get 20% off. I uh, want to welcome to the program staff writer at The Atlantic, author of... The new narrative nonfiction book, How the Word is Passed, A Reckoning with History, uh, with the History of Slavery Across America. Clint Smith, uh, welcome to the program. Do we have him? Oh, there he is. Uh, hey there. Clint, welcome to the program. We have uh, uh, Emma Vigland here as well. How are you all? Doing uh, well. Thanks for being here, Clint. Uh, yeah, thanks, for ju thanks for joining us. You know, you're, um, you, uh, to a certain extent, I mean, this may be completely far out of field, but uh, there was a quality of, of your book that, um, and, and it was it's far more deliberate, but it reminded me of uh, this movie, this documentary from like 30 years ago called Sherman's March uh, mm -hmm. by Ross McKelvey, a, 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 a documentary filmmaker up at Harvard who, who went off to do Sherman's March and then ended up just talking about the world in general. And I think on some level, what's interesting about your book to me is it is both an exploration of, of, of history and the massive absence of 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 this history um you went to uh, uh eight different sites i think you went to more uh but you ended up writing about eight just what was the what was the idea behind wh why did you decide to 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 write this book and and in particularly like the way you did um uh, write it yeah so this book began in May 2017 when I was watching the statues of uh, several Confederate statues come down in my hometown in New Orleans. So I was watching statues of Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, PGT Beauregard, all leaders in the Confederacy be taken down. And I was wondering what it meant that I grew up in a majority black city in which there were more homages to enslavers than there were to enslaved people. And what does it mean that to get to school, I had to go down Robert E. Lee Boulevard. To get to the grocery store, I had to go down Jefferson Davis Highway. That my middle school was named after a leader of the Confederacy. That to this day, my parents live on a street named after somebody who owned 150 enslaved people. Because the thing about monuments and memorials and iconography is that, and symbols is that they're not just symbols. They are reflective of the stories that societies tell and those you know, stories embed themselves into the narratives communities carry and those narratives shape public policy and public policy shapes the material conditions of people's lives which isn't to say that taking down a 60 foot tall statue of robert e lee is going to erase the racial wealth gap but it is to say that it is part of uh it is one part of a larger ecosystem of stories and ideas that shape how we understand what has happened to certain communities and what needs to be accounted for uh, and what needs to be amended uh, to repair the harm that has been done to different communities across generations. And so I started getting obsessed with how slavery was remembered or misremembered in New Orleans and then sort of expanded it out to think about how it was remembered or misremembered across the country and ultimately wanted to go to different places that represented the, the sort of patchwork of memory and the patchwork of experiences that uh, are reflective of how of the inconsistent way that this country memorializes slavery i i i have become um i mean we're, we're sort of in a period it's it seems to me of a um like a corrective period about that history just seemingly um being more more present and maybe we can talk about maybe why that is we're going through this period and 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 certainly i feel like um in my 
in my education, you know, like it just seems like I, I learned nothing. You know, I wasn't necessarily a bad student. I wasn't necessarily a good student, but it just seemed, seemed to be uh, available at the time. But I wonder, like on that that primary question, like do, as you grew up in that context, in the shadow of all these uh, homages to to enslavers, like what what was the, the was there consciousness of that i mean you individually or just like with your friends i mean did it occur, occur to anybody to say like hey wait a second what that's really messed up like i'm just trying to think like if i walked down the street and it was like you know i'm just going down goebbels avenue and uh one day it occurs to me like wait a second uh there's a you know i i have some history with that guy a little bit but what but I, was there a level of consciousness about that or i think part of the insidiousness of the success of the lost cause project um it's and the success of uh, uh history of white supremacy attempting to distort and manipulate history more generally is that i didn't really have any any consciousness of what those statues were or what they represented you know i i think all the time about how uh the statue of pugt Beauregard sits in the you know in front of city park uh, where I would go and like feed the ducks and the geese with my mom on the weekends. And that I was literally, you know, feeding the ducks under the statue of a man who ordered the first attack that opened the civil war. But I had no conception of who that person was. He was part of, uh, he felt like he was just part of what ornamented the entire city, which are these statues of white men on pedestals. Um, and so it wasn't until my adulthood that I feel like I gained a more acute understanding of who these people were and what they stood for. And part of the thing is that part of what white supremacy attempts to do is take empirical statements and turn them into ideological ones, right? So if I say the Confederacy was a treasonous territory that that seceded from the Union and raised an army predicated on maintaining and expanding the institution of slavery, from in a lot of circles, that would be perceived as an ideological statement. And if I'm in a classroom, that would be perceived as me attempting to indoctrinate students with my political beliefs, when it's actually just reflective of the empirical and historical evidence that we have, right? Like the, the Confederacy said it for themselves. They, If you look at the declarations of Confederate secession in 1861, they, they say it. A state like Mississippi says, quote, our position is thoroughly aligned with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interests of the world. All right. So they were not vague about why they were seceding from the union. They were quite clear about it. But part of what has happened over the course of a, more than a century now is that those stories uh, and that sort of evidence, that sort of primary source evidence is not presented to students. And so the narrative of the Confederacy being this thing that was just fighting for states' rights or Robert E. Lee being an honorable man who was just doing right by his community or that this war was a war of northern aggression rather than uh, one that was predicated on these folks leaving the country in order to sustain this uh, abominable social and economic practice, um, it gets muddled, right? It becomes a sort of Orwellian thing where it's not even meant to make turn everybody into racist. It's just meant to make people confused to the point where in 2018, you have a study from the Southern Poverty Law Center that shows that only 8% of U.S. high school seniors are able to identify slavery as the central cause of the Civil War because we, we our teaching around it has been so, people are either scared to address it at all right, for fear that something will happen. And I think we see in state legislatures across the country uh, an intentional effort to to amplify and magnify that chilling effect, to make teachers scared to even touch this stuff so that you have continue to have young people growing up with a skewed sense of what the Confederacy was, what slavery was, and, and thus how it has shaped the social, economic, and political landscape of, of our country today. Well, and, well part and, of this too, I, I would say, is like it goes deeper than just i think the civil war as well right i mean there's this this concept of thomas jefferson you write about the, the with monticello about how there's a quote uh from someone who took the tour that says this really took the shine off of our guy because it, it's about this greater american mythology mm -hmm. that upholds then secondarily the conversation that we're talking about the civil war right i mean can you just talk about the deeper roots of how we we fetishize mythologize whatever you want to say our founding fathers it is rooted in american exceptionalism and white supremacy and then of course it's at its starkest in the way that we learn about the civil war yeah absolutely so the first chapter of the book is about monticello and and i wanted to go to monticello specifically because 
Jefferson is such a fascinating historical character to me in the sense that I think he personifies so many of the complexities and contradictions and the sort of cognitive dissonance of this country's history, which is to say that this America is a place that has provided unparalleled, unimaginable opportunities for millions of people across generations to achieve uh, wealth accumulation and upward mobility in ways that their ancestors could have never imagined. And it has done so at the direct expense of millions and millions of other people who've been intergenerationally subjugated and oppressed to create that wealth and opportunity for the other group. And so both of those things are the story of America. And you have to hold the sort of duality uh, of both of those things in order to understand the duality of this country. And Jefferson similarly, I think, again, embodies that where he is someone who wrote one of the most important documents in the history of the Western world and also enslaved over 600 people over the course of his lifetime, including four of his own children that he had by an enslaved woman, Sally Hemings. He wrote in one document that all men are created equal and wrote in another document that black people are inferior to whites, quote, in both endowments of body and mind. And so when I go to a place like Monticello, part of what I'm trying to understand is how does an institution that is in many ways dedicated to preserving the memory and legacy of this person preserve an honest legacy of all of who he was. And not only in, in, in preserving that space, Monticello, recognizing that Monticello didn't just belong to Jefferson, but also the hundreds of enslaved people who lived there across generations, who in many ways that land belongs to even more so than it does to Jefferson, because Jefferson was in Paris, in DC, in Philadelphia, in New York for significant stretches of time. And it was these enslaved families, the Hemingses, the Fawcett's, the Grangers, who who cultivated that land, who built memories on that land, who created community on that land. Um, and so in order to understand, again, to your point, like why our country looks the way that it does today, we have to understand the, the nature of how the people who created the social contract upon which this country was founded, who they wanted to include in the, that, the, as the beneficiaries of that con social contract and who they imagined being the people who were going to be exploited to make those benefits possible for others. And, and, and speaking of that exploitation, what is also, I think, sort of fascinating about that is that, you know, he as a farmer has will, would have no time to do that. We're not for like uh, for, you know, like I. I, I never hear it anymore, but 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 as a kid, I remember you know there was like this like behind every uh, great man is a you know is a is, is a great woman or a strong woman or something like that. And but um, I reject that cheesy uh, statement. I, I, but but the interesting thing is is like you know uh, behind every guy who had the time to draft a constitution for is you know five hundred slaves essentially who were financing uh, this guy's being able to have all this time to think um, and that. It, it, it was was really striking like that concept and 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 that is not it in any way communicated i think well i mean so let's also talk about that the 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 concept of you like um you, you could have just written about these places without sort of um assessing how people who are learning these things for the first time and, and or or you know we're absorbing them i mean talk about that dynamic where you're you're interviewing people as they they the, as the shine comes off of uh, of jefferson a little bit yeah so two of the people that i interviewed were uh women named donna and grace and and so monticello is interesting because i think it represents a place that evolves in the way that is told has evolved in the way that it is told the story of that place and of jefferson so you know you talk to people who went there 30 20 10 years ago their experience at monticello is very different from what i experienced when i went there in 2018 um where now they have a, a tour dedicated to the hemmings family they have a tour specifically about the history of slavery at monticello uh but some critique of it is that all of these tours are are separate tours right and that there's the primary house tour um, in which somebody, uh, you know, I went on the house tour and I went on the slavery at Monticello tour and on the house tour, there wasn't really a lot of discussion about Jefferson as an enslaver. It might've been mentioned, but to your point that I think is really important is that like nothing, you know, Jefferson is, a, was a very smart person and, and had a range of interests, philo philosophical, scientific, um, geographic. I mean, he, you know, his mind was sort of everywhere, but he only had the time to pursue those interests, uh, to write these letters, to explore these ideas because of the labor of, a, of hundreds of enslaved people who did that. 
And so I was on I was on the slavery at Monticello tour, and Donna and Grace were clearly being uh, unsettled by what so much of what they were hearing from our guide, a guy named David Thorson. And David, you know, I, as I mentioned in the book, in the span of forty five minutes to an hour, was more direct and honest about Jefferson and the, his relationship to slavery in ways that I I was like, why didn't I learn this in eighth grade? social studies class. Like this should have been central to, to my understanding of this, but they were, um, but I was familiar with the information and these women from what I could tell on their faces clearly weren't. So I went up to them after and was talking to them and they were just like, I had no idea that Jefferson was a slave owner. I had no idea that Monticello was a plantation. And mind you, these are folks who like bought plane tickets, rented a car, got a hotel room and like came to this place as a sort of pilgrimage to uh, to honor and to find to to see the home of the, one of our founding fathers and the third president of the United States, and who had no idea that he enslaved human beings. And I, th- I think that that is a sort of microcosm of the failure of how slavery is taught across this country, um, in which you could have people who came to this place to pay tribute to this man, and who had no idea what this place actually was, and who this man. And what this man did to people on this land. Um, and, and I think it was an important reminder for me because I think in the worlds that I move in, um, every, everybody's like, oh, Jefferson, Jefferson was an enslaver. Like he's, you know, he was a, he's a hypocrite. He was more, full of moral contradictions. Like that is how we understand who Jefferson was. But there are a lot of people who just don't know um, a lot of information and not just about Jefferson, but about slavery writ large. Um, and, and that is again, in, 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 is it intentional? It is intentional. It is the result of an F, uh, mid 19th century effort, uh, during, after the civil war to prevent the, to prevent us from having a collective understanding of what slavery was. And most people don't realize that it wasn't until the mid 20th century during the civil rights movement that the narrative around slavery began to shift. Like it wasn't until the work of historians like Kenneth Stamp and others and, and that his work gained mainstream popularity because of the work of activists and uh, civil rights leaders, that the understanding of slavery began to shift toward like, oh, this was a horrific, cruel, abominable institution. Because until the mid 20th century, the popular narrative around it collectively in this country was that it was a civilizing institution. Ulrich B. Phillips, the predominant historian who, who propagated this idea, talked about plantations as these places that uh, civilized Africans from the savage year of Africa, uh, that uh, as the late Senator John Calhoun from South Carolina, you know, he would always talk about slavery as a, as a positive good for both black and white alike. And that narrative was, was central to America's collective understanding of slavery for a century before it began to shift. And we're still attempting to sort of unwind uh, so much of that. Uh, yeah, I, that that dynamic I just find uh, fascinating. And I guess, I mean, it's sort of obvious on some level, like why it was um why so many participated in that that sort of um i guess mystification of of our history because um it it served their power interests right i mean uh, and 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 it sort of kicked off uh, you know during reconstruction with a lot of like literal massacres uh, to make sure that um, that they were in, in charge of those things let's let's talk about um y- the next place you write about and and I and I wonder, like you know, you, you go from uh, uh, Monticello to to the Whitney Plantation, then to the Angola Prison, uh, a, a cemetery, a Blanford Cemetery that is um, uh, of uh, Confederate um, uh, soldiers, then to Galveston Island, uh, for, you know, where uh, sort of the birthplace of, of Juneteenth, uh, up to New York City, and then to uh, Senegal at Gory Island. Um, what what was it? How did you want to order this? Um, like, was there a specific? I mean, you obviously went to a bunch of places, but was there a specific? When you were contemplating uh, the the ordering of these things, what what was behind that? It's a great question. Um, so the, it's not necessarily placed in chronological order, right? Um, you know, and part of what I wanted to do was tell what felt almost like a, it's not completely like this, but to some extent, like an intergenerational story of slavery and the different ways that it would manifest itself. Right. So, so 
Galveston and Juneteenth comes directly after Blanford, which is a place that is focused predominantly on and thinking about the Civil War and the legacy of the Civil War. And then I go before I go. So let me go back. So I begin with the two plantations, Monticello and the Whitney Plantation, and think about how those places that were central sites of enslavement in the South uh, reckon with that history. And then go to Angola, which is a place that, you know, I could have put Angola after um, the maybe after Juneteenth to talk about the way that convict leasing uh, shaped, you know, the and created the sort of afterlife of slavery, as the scholar Sidia Hartman talks about. Uh, but what I wanted to do in that instance was put Angola in conversation with the Whitney, given that they're both in Louisiana, given that they're only an hour apart from one another, um, given that the guy I go to Angola with, Norris Henderson, who was incarcerated at Angola for 30 years, talks about how when he goes to the Whitney, he is able to more effectively make sense of his experience at Angola. Uh, and so part of it is like trying to tell somewhat of a linear intergenerational story, but also not at the expense of being able to put things in conversation with one another um, that I think uh, stand well together or are helpful for the reader um, and helpful for me in making sense of these things when when they're side by side. Um, oh, so, um, so tell us about Angola, because this is um, also like one of those things where I think is in somewhat analogous to the idea of like, you know, walking down, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, walking down the Klaus Barbie Boulevard or something mm -hmm. uh, on some level and going, hey, wait a second. What? Uh, yeah. uh, uh, tell us about Angola prison. This is a massive, massive uh, prison in Louisiana. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because I think about that all the time with Angola. So Angola is the largest maximum security prison in the country. It is 18,000 acres wide, bigger than the island of Manhattan. It is a place where 75% of the people held there are black men. Over 70% of them are serving life sentences. Uh, and it is built on top of a former plantation. And what I tell people is that if you were to go to Germany and you had the largest maximum security prison in Germany, and it was built on top of a former concentration camp in which the people held there were disproportionately Jewish, that place would rightfully be a global emblem of anti-Semitism. It would be abhorrent. It would be disgusting. We would never allow a place like that to exist because it would so clearly run counter to all of our moral and ethical sensibilities. And yet here in the United States, we have the largest maximum security prison in the country where the vast majority of people held there are black men serving life sentences, working for virtually no pay on land that was once a plantation, picking crops while someone watches over them on horseback with a gun over their shoulder. And so part of what I'm exploring when I go to Angola is, is what are the ways that a history of white supremacy not only enacts physical violence against people's bodies, but also collectively numbs us to certain types of violences that in, in another global context would be wildly unacceptable. And what does it mean that that place not only is not addressing and confronting and being honest about its relationship to that history, um, but that that place has a gift shop in front of it. And at, at the gift shop in front of the prison is uh, our pair of are there shot glasses and uh, baseball caps and stuffed animals and sweatshirts and coffee mugs. And on one of the coffee mugs, there's a, there's a silhouette of a watchtower and above and below there's, there's text written and it says Angola, a gated community. And so not only is it not addressing its relationship to this history, but it's, it's making a mockery of or, and belittling and, and making fun of the experiences of thousands of people who are still held there today, many of whom were sentenced to serve life in prison there when they were children, many of whom were sentenced by non-unanimous juries, which has since been rendered unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, right? And so, you know, I could have written a whole book about well, they Angola. literally have a rodeo. I mean, they, they have a rodeo. They have yeah. a like to talk about making a mockery of it. They have uh, you can maybe expand on this, but they have a show where people buy tickets and they watch the people who are imprisoned. Is my understanding perform in this rodeo for like a chance at some small payout? Yeah, yeah. So I've not experienced the rodeo. Uh, personally um i've seen a lot of footage of it and read a lot about it but um it is it's interesting because some people attempt to sit, take the rodeo and they'll be like oh well like the people who are participating in the rodeo like they choose to do it like they it's their decision they're not being forced to do it but the thing that you have to understand about prison um 
is that you have so little agency and the nature of your days is full of so much monotony that you look for anything to to break up the monotony of your time to and to give you a sense of something to look forward to even when the thing to look forward to is dangerous and might result in you getting run over by a bull and like having i mean there are stories of people who've broken legs broken arms broken their necks um but if you it's it's like if you were in a desert and somebody shows up in the desert and they have like a cup of dirty water and they're like do you want this dirty water you're gonna be like yeah i want that dirty water and it's not and and that person it would be wrong then for somebody to be like well you love dirty water you decided to drink that dirty water so like you just you must like doing it it's it, when you have limited options of ways with which to make meaning of your life or to do anything other than sit inside your cell people grab hold of those even when it is as cruel and insidious as it is and so i think any sort of idea of like per a person making a decision to do something has to be understood in the context from which that decision is emerging i i have to say that like you know if i if i it, 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 the 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 idea that uh, angola is built on a plantation it's almost like if it almost seems manufactured like i i want to do a movie and i want to um you know create this metaphor of you know sort of like what of the legacy of, of slavery and just how it mutates into um you know the way that we can still maintain this type of social control and uh create an underclass i have an idea let's situate a prison on top of a plantation like i mean that's it almost seems like um like like, like uh, almost like fictional like a fictional choice um talk about blandford cemetery um that was not originally where you were intending to go it was not um and part of what i really enjoyed about the book. I think any nonfiction writer, you know, the process is like you write a proposal and you tell the publisher, like, this is what I'm going to write about. This is the people I'm going to talk to. These are the things I'm going to do. And then, you know, a year, two years, three years later, you you look at your book and you're like, this is very different than <laughs> what my proposal said. Uh, and especially with a book like this, where like, I, I literally, even in the places that I went, like I wanted to go to Monticello and I wrote about Monticello, even at a place like Monticello, so much of how I write about that place depends on the people I meet at that time, at that on that day, um, in that place, right? So, so it is. None of these are sort of definitive accounts of any of these places. They are reflections of my experience at an at each of these places at any given point in time. Uh, but the Blandford, you know, I initially thought I was going to write a chapter on uh, Civil War battlefields, and I, so I went to this uh, Civil War battlefield. Uh, that's a national park in petersburg virginia and and i went on the tour and i was like okay this is interesting i think there's something here but i was telling the tour guide uh the ranger about my project and he was like oh you should go to uh this confederate cemetery it's about 10 minutes down the road and i was like confederate cemetery i mean it's, it's something that i would have never there's like things you would do on your own and then things you do as a journalist like in my own capacity i'd be like there's no chance that i'm ever gonna go to a confederate cemetery but so you know my the the journalist in me started you know uh being like oh okay i think that that's that sounds like a fascinating thing that i had that, that like truly wasn't it was never even on my mind uh as a potential possibility and so i went and i think you know i went on this tour in which they gave this tour of of the church and and for context blanford is one of the largest confederate cemeteries in the country a place where the remains of thirty thousand confederate soldiers are buried and and i went on a tour of the church at the center of the cemetery. And they were pointing to all these stained glass windows and talking in intimate detail about their history. And then the tour ended. And I was like, well, this is this is bizarre that we just spent all this time talking about the beauty of these stained glass windows with with saints, you know, in embedded in them. And we're not talking at all about why these windows were built, like who they were built in honor of, or the land that we're standing on. And literally that at the bottom of the windows, it says, in honor of our brave Confederate soldiers who fought for a just cause and different iterations of that. And so then I came back, uh, there was a flyer inside of the visitor center. I was talking to the, to a woman who works inside the visitor center and there was a flyer on the, on the desk in front of her. And we were talking, my eyes started kind of wandering. And I looked down and I was like, what is that? And then she like 
thrust her hand on top of it. And I was like, oh, this is this is strange. And and I sort of could read between her fingers that it was a flyer promoting uh, the Sons of Confederate Veterans Memorial Day celebration happening there a few weeks from then. And so I was like, well, I have to come back for this. And so I, I came back for the Sons of Confederate Veterans Memorial Day celebration. Um, and uh, I was I was conspicuous, as you can imagine, uh, a conspicuous presence. I went with my white friend, William. My wife wouldn't let me go by myself. She was like, you got to take you got to take your white friend. And so I was like, Billy, come on, man. We got to go to we got to go to the Confederate Cemetery. Um, and so we went and. And it was just so clarifying. Uh, because I was spending the day with these Sons of Confederate Veterans, these United Daughters of the Confederacy, these um, re- Confederate reenactors, neo-Confederates, um, kind of the whole spectrum, and and having conversations with them about why they believed what they believed, you know, that slavery wasn't a central cause of the Civil War, that it was overblown, that it was the nor- War of Northern Aggression, that the, you know, all the people buried in this uh, Confederate cemetery were people worthy of being honored, that uh, you know, and the keynote speaker was Paul C. Grambling, who was at that time the commander in chief, as they call it, of the Sons Confederate Veterans. And when he was giving his speech, he said that all the people who wanted to take down the statues of Confederate uh, leaders were were the American ISIS. He's like they're terrorists, and they're trying to erase history in the same way that ISIS is in the Middle East, uh, and we should treat them as such. Um, and so, it was just again, clarifying to understand how the lost cause manifests itself today. Because I think for some people, you can, you know, their understanding of history is not grounded in empirical evidence or primary source documents. It is a story they have been told. And it is a story they tell. It is an heirloom that is passed down across generations. Um, And who they understand themselves to be in the world is very much shaped by uh, the stories they've been told by people they love, even when those stories are, are, are false. So is that, is that relationship that they have to the story, is it, is it a relationship that exists to their, uh, to the people who told them it, or is it, is, is you know, like how much of that story is also important? Like they could have been told any story, right? And, yeah. Oh, you're you're telling me something contrary to that. That has implications to like my relationship with my my grandfather who passed away. Like, because he's the one who told me that story. And if that story's not real, what else don't I know about him? And and everything I thought about him was wrong. And it that implicates that relationship as opposed to the part of it where it's like, oh, the reality you're telling me implicates my relationship to just like everything around me and who I am in the world. You know, distinct from my finding out that my grand my grandfather was sort of a fraud or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's like, how much of what do you think that balance is there? I think it's it's absolutely both. Um, I mean, I think about a conversation I had with a guy named Jeff who uh, told me about how when he was a kid, he would his grandfather would take him to the cemetery and they would sit in the gazebo uh, at the center of the cemetery and and watch at dusk as the sun would set and the deers would sort of slalom through the tombstones and he would sing him songs that his grandfather had sang him and he would tell him about all the people who were buried here who were part of his community part of his family and how they they're so misunderstood by this country and how they fought a war to protect their families and their loved ones and that you know they weren't racist and slavery had nothing to do with it and um, that's propaganda and that's and so these are the stories that Jeff grows up with and and Jeff now has his own granddaughters who he brings to the cemetery and tells the same story to. And so it very much is deeply entangled in a sort of emotional and psychological and intimate relationship that people have with the people they love who told them these stories. And we see this manifest itself not only in the lost call, we see this in religion, we see this in politics, we see this in all uh, there are all sorts of ways that the heirloom of ideology is passed down and people either grapple with it and reject it or create nuance within it or create distinct like granddad is uh, homophobic and racist and like, you know, and you put that here and then you like still go to Thanksgiving dinner and you just try to keep it or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, but for a lot of people, there's if if they are if they accept that so many of the stories that they, that they're the people who love them told them about who they were 
who this country is, who their community is, it it becomes difficult to disentangle their love for that person from the things that that person told them. And I think embedded within that is your second point of then it brings in, it becomes this existential question or this existential crisis where so much of how someone has come to understand themselves in the world has been shaped by the stories that they have been told by these people who were telling lies. And so if they're going to accept that these were lies, then it, it shatters so much of how they have situated themselves in relationship to history, in relationship to this country, in relationship to the world. And, and that is a hard thing for many people to, to let go of. You know, one of the guys at the end of the book that I talk about um, said, you, wanna, you want me to accept that my great-great-grandfather was a monster. And for me, I'm like, actually, I'm not interested in the interiority of your grandfather's heart or spirit. You know, like that's that's kind of secondary to me. Um, it is important that you accept that your grandfather, your great grandfather fought for a monstrous cause. Right. Like there's a difference between like whether someone is a monster and and the actions that they did. I mean, it's kind of the way that our understanding um, rightfully of, of how racism manifests itself is moving away from an interpersonal understanding of of its manifestations to a systemic a structural one one that's grounded in policy and and action um so so yeah it's it's if so much of who you believe yourself to be in the world is animated by things you realize are lies then you just tell yourself that they're not lies and you say that everybody else is lying i i almost feel like when when you were saying that that like we need to put an asterisk on this so that we do not um uh fall foul of the uh, critical race theories um uh <laughs> that we have to, to, um i mean to a certain extent like that's what that whole critical race theory i don't know a uh, boogie man or person that is being unleashed it feels like on some level is a reaction on to to I mean, I don't know. I don't think I'm imagining that there has been a sort of revisiting of the implications of slavery over the past like 10, 10 years or so. I mean, just in terms of like, you know, we do five interviews a week or four interviews a week. And just like the, the books that are coming out about, you know, the relationship of, of the co of cotton to the entire country's economy. There was, you know, uh, and, and there has been more sort of uh, of, of uh, you know, in, in reconstruction. Um, and uh, and Juneteenth, it sort of feels like it's making a little bit of a, Tulsa a, of a comeback. Race well, master, Tulsa, yeah. like, Tulsa and Charleston and all the other ones that yeah. we um but do you, I mean, what do you think accounts for this? I mean, like what's happening generationally that there is space for this now? Is it just like that certain generations have died off and there's space or that there's, what else do you think is happening? I mean, I think, I, I think it is mostly attributed to the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, I think in the same way that the civil rights movement completely recalibrated the way that people understood the origins of black, white inequality. Um, and lifted up an entire new generation of social historians who who used history um, to make sense of the the present, to make sense of why what we were seeing with Jim Crow, to make sense of what we were seeing with segregation, to make sense what, of what we were seeing with white supremacist violence, and that gave people a new understanding of the history from which it emerged. I think now, since you know 2012, 2013. Um, th part of what activists and organizers have done is open up space for writers and academics and journalists and artists to go back into that history to help us understand that what happened to Mike Brown, what happened to Renisha McBride, what happened to Eric Garner, what happened to, you know, the list goes on and on with George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, is not, they're not isolated incidents, but the, the context that shaped what those police departments look like, the historical context that shaped what the communities look like in which those police are operating, the context that has shaped what sort of resources communities do or don't have socially and economically, that that is all part of a history that, that we tell ourselves was a long time ago, but it in fact wasn't that long ago at all. And, and part of what I want the reader to understand in this book is that we both have a, a physical proximity to this landscape that is profound in which the scars of this history are, are all around us. You know, I wrote this book about nine places. I could have written about 10,000 and nine, you know, it's, it's everywhere, but not only our physical proximity, but our temporal proximity, 
right? That that this institution existed for 250 years and has only not existed for 150. So it existed for 100 years longer than than it didn't. And and again, there, there are people who are still with us who had relationships to those who were born into bondage. The woman who opened the museum, the National Museum of African American History and Culture in 2016 alongside the Obama family was the daughter of an enslaved person. Like not the granddaughter or the great granddaughter. She was the daughter of someone who was born into slavery. And this is in 2016. My grandfather's grandfather was enslaved, right? So when I imagine my grand, my son, my four-year-old son sitting on my grandfather's lap, I think about my grandfather and imagine him sitting on his grandfather's lap. And I'm reminded that, again, this history we tell ourselves was a long time ago, wasn't that long ago at all. And so the idea that that history, which wasn't that long ago, would have nothing to do with what our contemporary landscape of inequality looks like is morally and intellectually disingenuous. It has everything to do with it. All our political, economic, and social infrastructure has been shaped by this thing that was only a few generations ago. And not to mention, I think one of the things that your book shows too is that the elements of that institution still exist. Like the the ideological framework and the understanding of the world uh, is still being taught on some level. And so uh, the the actual dynamic of, of the institution doesn't exist, but sort of like the, the the vapors of it is still sort of floating around in the air in some fashion. Yeah, and, and sort of... Uh like the scholar Sadia Hartman talks about it as the afterlife of slavery, right? In which, you know, if we think about prison, for example, I'm not someone who would say that prison is slavery. Um, I think they are two phenomenologically different things and like should be interrogated on their own terms and their own precise terms, right? But certainly contemporary prisons in our contemporary carceral state carries the the remnants and the residue of that history, history. In, in, in really profound ways. Um, and that that needs to be understood and accounted for, and not just in things that are sort of self-evident, like our prison system, but in, you know, our electoral college, you know, our history of gerrymandering, our, the zoning policies we have, the, I mean, just the list goes on and on and on, but ultimately you realize that the reason one community looks one way and another community looks another way is not because singularly of the people in those communities, or what they have or have not done, but it's because of what has been done to those communities generation after generation after generation. And so this book is about slavery, but that's, you know, and even if we were just to account for slavery, that would be true. But then when it kept going, then with the Black Codes, then with Jim Crow, then with segregation, not with redlining, and then, you know, mass incarceration, mass criminalization. So we see and continue to see different iterations of it. Um, and and part of what it uh, an, a part of what a deep understanding of history does and part of why you have so many state sanctioned efforts and legislatures across the country attempting to to ch prevent teachers from teaching it is because when you realize the history of this country, this country can't lie to you anymore. It right. can't lie to you about why certain people have things and certain people don't. And it, they you can no longer attribute it to notions of like what people morally deserve or don't deserve because they did or didn't work hard. But you understand it as being the result of, again, like state sanctioned policies that have been enacted across generations. Clint Smith, the uh, book is How the Word is Passed, A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America. Thank you so much for your time today. We'll put a link to that at uh, majority.fm. Again, really appreciate you coming on. Thank you both. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the Zoom. It is a, a pleasure to welcome to the program the Carl M. Loeb University professor at Harvard University, Annette Gordon-Reed, and author of her latest on Juneteenth. Uh, professor, welcome uh, to the program. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. So um, let's start with a fairly uh, uh, basic and remedial question. Uh, <laughs> June 9th, uh, Juneteenth, mm -hmm. um, tell folks what it celebrates. June celebrates, commemorates June 19th, 1865, when United States Army General Gordon Granger went to Galveston, Texas, to make the announcement that slavery was over in Texas and that enslaved people were then supposed to occupy a, a position of absolute equality with the people who formerly enslaved them. So it was the end of slavery in Texas. 
And it also represented the last um, place in the country that that slavery was was ended. Yes. Well, no, uh, because here's the twist. Slavery legally ended in December, at the end of December, 1865, when the 13th Amendment was ratified. What this really is, is marks the end of the of sort of organized hostilities. The Confederate Army, the Army of the Trans-Mississippi had kept fighting after Lee um, surrendered in April, and they didn't give up until the beginning of June. And it wasn't until then that Granger was able to go in and based on the Emancipation Proclamation, because they could take control of the territory, make the announcement that slavery in Texas was over. There, you know, Delaware still had, you know, slavery that didn't end until, um, as I said, December 31st, uh, 1865, with the ratification of the 13th Amendment. But this was the end of the Confederacy's armed effort to maintain the system of slavery. Um, and and we should say your book is uh, part uh, history, part memoir. You yourself were raised in Texas and um, um, have uh, a, a, a quite a story. But let's let's go back to the the beginnings of 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 Texas. I mean, the interesting thing that I found um, in, in in reading your book was Texas is in many respects a um, there's a there's a lot of parallels between Texas and mm-hmm the country yes. um, at, at large. Um, but let's start with um, the first slaves that were, were in Texas uh, when it was um, uh, not even quite, I guess, Mexico. We're talking the 1500s at this point. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, tell us about uh, Esteban uh, Banico. Mm-hmm. Estebanico, who's a person that I first heard of in maybe fourth or seventh grade. I don't remember which one, Texas history, but he was only mentioned in passing. He was an enslaved man who came with the Spanish explorers, uh, among them Cabeza de Vaca. That would be the name that most people would have heard of uh, to originally going to Florida. They were in Cuba for a time and ended up crossing uh, the Gulf of Mexico after their ship was lost in a raft and landing near Galveston, Texas, on the on the coast of Texas. And, you know, Estebanico was a, you know, a, a person he was a had been a Muslim who had been forced to convert to Christianity and came with these explorers. And during this ordeal where they dwindled down to basically four guys walking across Texas and uh, being enslaved by indigenous people for some time, escaping from them, he served as a translator as they moved across the land. He apparently had a, a talent for languages and was an integral part of this the, the fi- this dwindled expedition, uh, he ended up being killed by Native Americans, unfortunately. But it was a very different story, um, very different introduction to, I think, uh, to slavery or to understanding about blacks in North America by looking at Estebanico as opposed to Jamestown, 1619. This is this is a century before then. Right. Uh, and uh, there were people of African descent, others, not just Estebanico who came to the area that was Texas, uh, was Spanish territory that would be Texas and Mexico well before we think of um, uh, uh, the 20 people who were brought to Jamestown. And in St. Augustine in Florida, a similar pattern with Spanish explorers who brought uh, enslaved people from Africa to the shores of North America. And 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 what really is, um, I, I think, you know, uh, stunning in, in many respects is the um, is how much Texas's origins were not Caucasian yes. <laughs> and how much are, and I guess, you know, I'm thinking of Westerns, uh-huh. the, 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 the perception of Texas is yeah. <laughs> super Caucasian. I mean, yeah. you know, I, I mean, I was raised, you know, John Wayne and, 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 and that um, sort of like perception uh, and, um, but in fact, uh, w- w- walk us through how, you know, the, the relationship, how Texas became essentially, um, uh, uh, was, was part of the westward expansion and, and how it gained its independence, uh-huh. uh, from, from Mexico. 
Well, there were people from settlers, Anglo settlers in Texas who were coming over from Mississippi and Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama and Georgia for, you know, for a long time. And they brought enslaved people with them. But these little pockets of people coming. Uh, Stephen F. Austin, who is considered the father of Texas, um, actually his father himself, Moses Austin, got the right to, to land, to parcel out to settlers who wanted to come to Texas. And these people brought enslaved people with them. So that's how slavery comes into Texas through Stephen F. Austin and uh, the settlers who the 300, I think, is the, you know, the number of people. There are more than that, more or less than that. But they came with um, enslaved people from the deep south. So this is in the 1820s before Texas, certainly long before Texas is a state. Uh, at some point uh, when the Mexicans break away from the Spanish, they have the idea that they're going to outlaw slavery and which they do. They kind of look the other way for what's going on in the province of Texas because they wanted settlers to come because they wanted to have them sort of as a, a buffer or a bulwark against the Comanche and Apache who were going in the territory and who were claiming land at the same time. So, uh, te- you know, slavery was a part of it when the, the uh, Texans, Texians as they were called, broke away from Mexico. They wrote a constitution that unlike the American constitution explicitly talks about slavery and supports it. And it also talks about the fact that people of African descent could not be citizens of Texas. So it's, you know, the American constitution talks about persons held to service. They event some sort of you know, discomfort with this idea, but this is no holds barred. Uh, this is a slaveholders Republic. And that's how it's in the document itself. That's how Texas uh, began. And I should also say, it, uh, they copied the American Declaration of Independence in lots of ways, but they took out the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They skip over that part, the part that we think is, you know, we consider to be America's creed and which people all over the world have looked to, they removed it. So that gives you a sense of what the state, the, the new, I should say, republic was, was about. Uh, and we should say, I mean, I, it's just it's fascinating to me that the um, the Mexicans were sort of engaging in their own, I guess, colonial project um, against yeah. ind- indigenous folks there, but using um, almost like outsourcing that mm-hmm. to um, and, and many of these were, were were farmers. I mean, what when they were coming with their slaves to work, obviously, for for you know, primarily agricultural reasons, like what, what were their crops at that point? I mean, what was, uh, what was it, was it, were they, were they just basically trying to transfer the, uh, the tobacco or, I mean, excuse me, the, the cotton or Mm -hmm. was there other uh, notions there? And, and I'm curious as to sort of the, 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 the terrain and the opportunity there for, for agriculture. I mean, they, I guess I'm trying to get at is like, the value of their slaves to them was integral to their ability in, in their minds to, to make a lot of money. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, Stephen F. Austin, who styled himself as anti-slavery, not because he you know, cared about you know, the humanity of black people, but because he didn't he was discomforted by the discomforted by the thought of lots of black people and that the population that would be required in order to maintain the slave system. So he was somewhat ambivalent about it. But he also said that if people came to Texas without slavery, large numbers of people, they could expect to be poor for a very long time. Uh, They understood that this labor system was integral to what they wanted to create in Texas. This is in the 1820s. We're beginning to see, you know, the cotton start to take off, become an incredible, uh, incredibly important uh, crop. And they wanted to extend the cotton empire into East Texas. And that's, you know, the most populous part of the state. We think about Texas in terms of the West and a desert and people think, well, you know, where are you going to get cotton there? And you know, su- sugar cane, too, was the other crop uh, that they that they cultivated. So this was supposed to be about the expanding cotton empire. And they're explicit about that and understood that the people who came 
really wanted to make sure that their property rights would be protected while they were there. And so that, as I said, was the impetus for creating a constitution, made it a constitutional matter um, that slavery would be accepted and that free blacks would not be allowed unless they had permission to stay there. And uh, that wasn't going to happen. I mean, right. it's a very clear a sort of a racial hierarchy that's uh, recognized in the state and slavery protected. Where where was that um, uh, level of dedication to slavery? Was that where could we see that in other at least states or province, I guess, you know, or territories at that time? Or, you know, was there was that was that rivaled by any other uh, state? Well, uh, you know, the Deep South, I mean, Georgia, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, all of those places had, you know, plantation slavery and expectation. People had legal property rights in uh, in, in slave people. What's unique about the Texas situation is that, uh, you know, the, uh, the other colonies, the 13 colonies all had slavery, right, uh, at some level. Not all were slave societies, but they were kind of, I don't want to say, I mean, sheepish about it, but they tried to hide what they were doing. Or they described this as a necessary evil. I mean, that was the sort of thought. But here it's much more open and, as I said, explicit. Um, so I, I can't say that just because they didn't talk about it in the same way that they weren't as committed to it. I mean, because, I mean, George and all those places right. were committed sure. right, and they went to war about this. Um, you know, but Texas you know, it created a problem. Anything, anytime something is new, right, and a new republic, before it gets to be a state, certainly it was controversial as a, as a state. There were a number of, of northern states who did not want Texas to be a part of the Union because it was a slave state. Uh, but during its republic phase, it was, you know, looked down upon in some ways. Even their trading partners were somewhat put off by the uh, the explicit nature of it as a slaveholders republic. Uh, w speak to the relationship between um, you know the I guess like, sort of the the Anglo's and uh, the Hispanics that were uh, you know there at the founding as well. Like what was that when when the the Texas uh, Republic uh, became a republic? Like what what was the relationship? Uh, between those who were maybe maintained some measure of um, uh, allegiance to, to Mexico or, or identified more with Mexico as opposed to those Anglos who had come from uh, the southern states with their slaves? Well, I mean, it started out, as I said, as a mutually, you know, you know beneficial, they thought, relationship. But once they got the republic, uh, there were efforts to move uh, Tejanos out of of of, te of out of the Republic of Texas. I mean, obviously there were people who were entrenched and who were who were part of the place, but it changed because they really wanted a government, a a, a state that was basically Anglo. So things shifted. They became much less tolerant of of people of Mexican descent in in the Republic of Texas. And that, that's been a theme. I don't talk about it as much because I don't go you know, into the, the 20th century and the, you know, some of the, well, I mean, there, there were problems all along, but suffice it to say that the kind of system of cooperation that had existed before ceased um, or came to a halt really once the Texan, Texians got their republic. Um, so let's, uh, through those, um, I guess those, the 30 years, um, the, you know, uh, Texas, um, um, uh, we get to when, uh, Gordon Granger came to, uh, uh announce abolish slavery. Talk about, I mean, you mentioned it briefly, but, uh, he also included in that a very, uh, uh called for the equality of personal rights and rights of property. Mm -hmm. uh, between the former masters and slaves. I was really mm -hmm. struck by, he didn't say masters and former slaves. Mm -hmm. It was like, mm -hmm. he, he, there was a loss of status mm -hmm. from those masters that mm -hmm. weren't just a question of, uh, um, tell us how that was received. Well, uh, it was received poorly. Um, 
the whole thing was received poorly. Uh, there was celebration on the part of enslaved people, obviously, but there were instances when people who celebrated were whipped uh, or were punished for celebrating. Uh, it was a time of violence against the freedmen. Uh, there are stories about you know, bodies in the rivers, you know, as the river flowing, bodies would be in it. And uh, uh, Eric Foner's book, Reconstruction, talks about a, a, a scene where uh, people describe coming into a village and seeing almost 30 bodies hanging from trees, men, women, and children. Um, the whites unleashed a, a torrent of violence on the, on the freed people. And so there was this combination of hopefulness at the same time as hostility, because you can imagine if you're right. used to uh, being able to own people and then someone takes that right away from you, uh, they responded with, 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 with a, trying to impose control to try to bring things back as near to slavery as possible without the legalized uh, aspect of it. And that was a campaign of terror in many instances. How, what, what was the trajectory there? I mean, because we have some uh, Southern states where um, the violence starts, um, you know, uh, 15, 20 years, sometimes 25 years into Reconstruction or, you know, or, or towards the end of Reconstruction, I should say, when uh, you've got, um, you know, established um, uh, like a, a black polity and, um, and, and power. Um, what, was, what was the trajectory in Texas through Reconstruction and, and into Jim Crow? Well, you know, the violence was there from the very, very beginning. There are anecdotes about people in Virginia and other places when someone didn't take their hat off to get shot. I mean, this is so the, the, the violence started early on, but it, it sort of escalates when you begin to see black people exercise the franchise, black men, because they were the only people who could, right. men could vote, exercise the franchise, hold office, those kinds of things. And voting became a really a sticking point for all of this because that's, you know, that's about equal citizenship and exercising equal citizenship. And the idea of this notion of Negro rule, which the Dunning School of hist History uh, in the early part of the 20th century put forward that this was some tragic time and as a way of justifying the violence that went along with people exercising their, their exercising their rights. And um, and so we have, uh, you know, the, the, the rise of Jim Crow, uh, which is um, a response to that uh, phenomena and, and coming out of uh, Reconstruction. Um, and so uh, give us a sense of what happens as we enter into uh, the beginning of the of the 20th century in terms of like the. The, the violence continues to to escalate there. I mean, what what um, you know, as we add into that peak of of like a, a renewed KKK in the country, mm -hmm. where is uh, Texas? And at what point do we start to see Juneteenth celebrations and, oh. and how are they received? Mm -hmm. are, are they received differently? Because, I mean, as a kid mm -hmm. growing up in the 70s, I guess. I didn't hear much about it. Now, granted, it's up in Massachusetts, but yeah. I didn't I didn't, I, I didn't I didn't hear much about it. Uh -huh. um, and it's you know, uh, you write that you were surprised to find out that it was a, a holiday celebrated outside of Texas. Uh -huh. um, but what was 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 it consistently celebrated uh, through those years in Texas? Were there times where there was more concern about being public in the, uh, the celebration uh, through these years? You know, it started. They started celebrating it right after Granger makes his announcement. Uh, the Freedmen's Bureau, when it's established, has uh, celebrations in, in the, the late 1860s. Uh, sometimes it was about instructing people about voting, how to vote, you know, what the procedures were, and so forth. Um, but they celebrated certainly in their homes, in their communities. It, a number of them were at churches. Uh, in the 1870s, 1876, four men in Houston uh, pull their resources and buy land to have a, a place where people can come to celebrate. And that land became Emancipation Park, which is still 
in Houston, which I have been to. And uh, so, yeah, from even in the face of the kind of hostility, people people celebrated it. And I, I sort of speculate in the in my book, I wonder if some of the celebrations in churches were done to try to forestall with the hope maybe of forestalling, you know, violence uh, here. But uh, this is considered to be the longest running continuous celebration of 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 emancipation, of an act of emancipation in the country's history. Why do you think it was that moment that became, I mean, uh, a, uh, you know, commemorated uh, as opposed to, I don't know, the passage of the 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 13th Amendment or of the, you know, uh, the, the signing of the emancipation, emancipation proclamation? Why, why, why that uh, one? It's an interesting question because I think Texans proselytized for it as they left Texas and one other places. They took the holiday with them and they talked about it. Uh, it's, I think, Juneteenth is a, is a fun word. I mean, it, it's, I mean, it's, it, it sounds silly, but you, there's a whole industry that, that talks about trying to find the right word to describe things, to brand something. Uh, Juneteenth has that. It's, it's, it, it's a nice sounding thing. It's a fun sounding thing. It is in the summer. Uh, and it is sort of a clearly a family oriented kind of holiday, a holiday about coming together. And it has caught on. I was surprised, as I said, when I learned that people celebrated it. But I think in the last two years in particular, last year, there was a huge spike in interest in the story. And I have heard and I think that this might be other people have posited that it was around uh, the George Floyd situation that, you know, it, this is around the same time. And here that got people to thinking about race and the predicament of African-Americans in the United States. And then you have this holiday that comes up that talks about the end of slavery and why was there slavery and what what are the legacies of slavery? So I think those things got melded together and social media you know, the capacity to talk about it, to make those kinds of connections. And, I, you know, people have said, people who do this have been saying that, following this, are saying that there was a huge spike in searches about, um, about Juneteenth during, during this time period. So it's, it's been steadily building, but the last two or three years, particularly last year, it was just a, a flood of interest in, in the holiday. Yeah, I don't think I um, remember hearing, you know, much about it as as, as such a uh, institution, even five or ten years ago. Yeah, uh, frankly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, and 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 I would imagine also the the close proximity to July Fourth, the the theme of independence, uh, mm -hmm. you know, has some something to do with it. But were there were there competing holidays? At any point, uh, if you're aware of, I mean, I'm always curious as I mean, to, com competing emancipation holidays. Yes. Other holidays that just simply did not have the resilience um, that Juneteenth did. I mean, people uh, evangelized it uh, coming out of Texas. Mm -hmm. Was there were there other that you're aware of other uh, emancipation holidays that just were not as, um, I guess, resilient? Uh, yeah. And, well, you mentioned some of the Emancipation Day, January 1st, in, in connection with the Emancipation Proclamation. But even saying that, you understand what the problem is with that. January 1st is a big holiday it's in its own holiday. right. Yes. In its own right. So and December 31st is not much better because it's New Year's Eve. Uh, it's a holiday. I mean, if you were to if we were to fixate on one of those, you'd be setting up a situation where people were continually disappointed because there would always be a distraction. People would be thinking about other things. New Year's Eve, Kwanzaa, New Year's Day, all of that. And I'm told that in Boston, they do celebrate Emancipation Day on January 1st. That I, I don't know that it's a state holiday, but that's that's a, a another candidate for a possible uh, a national holiday. I don't, know, I don't know that anybody's thought of making that a national holiday, but that is a competing holiday. And I think the problem is that they were, they were situated around other pivotal points, New Year's and New Year's Day and New Year's Eve, the end of the year and the beginning of the year. And that 
um, that creates a, a, you know, a, a conflict right there and why I don't think that they've taken on uh, the same, you know, they don't have the same cachet of June 19th, which is in the summer. Right. And it's a perfect day for family get togethers, travel, the weather's good. Uh, it, uh, there's just a lot to commend it. And where has Juneteenth been officially recognized? Um, um, it's a it's a state holiday in in Texas, and I, I think all but about uh, three states have some form of proclamation, some form of recognition of. It. They're not full. I don't think they're all full state holidays where people get off, but there are there's recognition of it in most states, and a lot of corporations. Uh, my own school, Harvard University, now. Uh, gives people the day off. I mean, school is not in session, but for staff and faculty and other people, uh, th- um, the day is off. And so it's growing in the private sector as well. It's being recognized as as a holiday. I just want to turn for, for a couple of moments um, uh, to your uh, your youth in Texas, because mm-hmm. your story of of your schooling mm-hmm. um, and, and what was happening uh, in Texas Um, uh, tell that story of how you, uh, you know, the circumstances in which you, you, you became, I guess, uh, you know, I don't know how you, you, you became the first to integrate your, your, your school as a, as a young child. I mean, I obviously, but, but describe, uh, a, that scenario, uh, why your parents, what, what your parents thinking was and, and what, um, uh, just uh, that experience in general. Uh-huh. Well, um, this is about 10 years after Brown and school districts in Texas and around the country were f- trying to find ways around Brown to not have to comply with it. And they came up with something called the Freedom of Choice Plan. And the idea was that white parents would pick white schools for their kids and black parents would pick black schools. My parents decided to do something different with me. I I had gone to the black school in our town, Booker T. Washington, for kindergarten. Um, But I was about to start first grade, and they decided that they would send me to Anderson Elementary School, which was a white school. My two older brothers, who were sort of in the middle of elementary school at Booker T. Washington, remained in those schools. But because I was starting you know, sort of real school, I guess they would have thought that they would send me there. And their, I have to say that their thinking, their explanation for why they did this kind of changed over time. It was portrayed in later years as a kind of pragmatic thing. Oh, we knew that the court was going to strike down freedom of choice plans. And we wanted you in place when this happened. My father talked about the fact that White schools were divided by age. There was elementary school, you know, intermediate, junior high, high school. And he thought, well, there must be something to that (laughs) if that's what they're doing. And we're in this K-12 situation and you're with older kids and blah, blah, blah. That's why we sent you. I think from remembering the time, from what I was able to glean as a kid at the time, I think that their ideals, that they were more idealistic. I mean, they were in the middle of, if you think of the times, this is, you know, around the, the passage of the Civil Rights Act, uh, the Voting Rights Act, there was a spirit of the times. And I think that they were flowing with that spirit of the times as they became, I guess I would say, more disillusioned about the effects of integration they changed the reason for why they did it. And it became a pragmatic decision more than idealism. Um, But I I think that they were idealistic in this, that they, they were part of a movement. Uh, And this was an example of that. And, and that's why they decided to, to send me to Anderson. Well, uh, from, uh, I mean, describe that experience. I mean, uh, you know, separate from your, your parents, you know, sort of, I guess, aspirations for what that would mean uh, that it sounds like, you know, over time, maybe um, weren't necessarily fulfilled. Uh-huh. Uh, but but from your experience, I mean, what what was the experience like for for you? 
Well, it was, I would say, a a tough time in some ways. My mother said at one point I, I broke out in hives. So you probably think that that might have been stress related in a way. Um, my teachers were my teacher, Mrs. Daughtry, <laughs> uh, my first grade teacher, Mrs. Daughtry, my second grade teacher, Mrs. Gillel. And those are the sort of formative, two formative, um, you know, teachers and, and periods when I was there were fantastic. I don't think they could have handled things better. And um, they made me feel completely at home. I, I never got any sense that I was treated any differently than anyone else. I, I say in the book, I was a good student, so I made things easy for them. And I'm a pretty even tempered person. So uh, I wasn't a problem, you know. And so from that on that front, things were easier. And I loved to learn. I loved to read. You know, my mother had put a lot into, you know, teaching me and and so forth. My mother, the teacher had been doing that even before I got there. So the actual academic part of it was thrilling to me and I enjoyed it. And so that's what made it, you know, a a happy place. School was a happy place for me. Now, some of the kids were nice and some of them weren't nice. So I learned through that process that not all white people were the same. Uh, but you know, I also had a sense of being, because I was on display, uh, various delegations of teachers or, or educators would come and stand in the door and sort of look in to see how this was going, how this experiment was going. Uh, and you know, I knew why they were there. And that was, that was something you don't know anything different, right? I mean, I had I'd never, not been in first grade before without that. So I figured, okay, I know why they're, they're there. And I'm supposed, to, and I'm on display here because this is a strange situation. I've done something that's different. And I, I did have that sense very early on uh, of being on display, having people and it sort of translated over the years or or transpired over the years that people knew who I was, but I didn't know who they were. Right. And sometimes people were hostile because they knew who I was and sometimes they were not. But a lot of times I I can recall people being, you know, hostile towards me. And and this was in in some situations, black children who resented uh, the fact that I had, what they thought started this process. And when the court struck down freedom of choice plans, they all had to change schools. And I kind of got blamed for that. I was a symbol of that. And people would be hostile to me, want to fight me. And I didn't even know who they were. You know, it, it was this bewildering kind of situation to be the object of, of people's um, scorn when you didn't know who they were. Now I knew why, but there's something about not knowing <laughs> a person right. who wants to fight you. You don't know who they are um, right. uh, was interesting. I would imagine. Uh, and, and I, I, and, and the concept that you were somehow responsible for the court case. Um, <laughs> well, these I mean, are kids, you know, I mean, well, it, it well, all gets course. matched together. Yeah, of yeah. course, of mm-hmm. course. Um, and, 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 and do you have a sense, I mean, maybe relative to your brothers, like what that did for your perception of, of how much of Texas was wrapped up in how much of Texas was, you know, sort of a white heritage versus a black heritage? Uh, I think what it did was to make me think about why we, this situation existed? What was the big deal about having a black child go to school with white people? What, why was this? Why were we in this at this space? Why is it when we went to the doctor, there was a um, waiting room for black people and a waiting room for white people? And the waiting room for white people was much better appointed, much larger and spacious and nice. And ours was, you know, functional. And, you know, sometimes we, you know, had to stand outside because it was not a room for everybody. You know, what was that about? And when we went to the movie, we had to sit in the balcony. Um, so I, I think it had w- awakened in me 
thoughts about race, the question of, of race. And certainly it, exa- it was exacerbated when I went to the school, the, the, the clinics and all those kinds of things. That was a part of daily life even before I went to Anderson. So I knew that even before I got to Anderson, I understood that black people and white people, that black people were treated differently than white people. Uh, but the experience in Anderson made me want to, made me analytical about it, I guess I would say, thinking why? What is this all about? Interesting. And I have to just also note that it's fascinating to me that freedom of choice um, was used in that era uh, to segregate um, uh, students in in some respect. And it sort of made a comeback in some of the um, uh, sort of uh, the the charter movement and the privatization movement Mm -hmm, and and mm -hmm. that type of thing in vouchers. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, but really, uh, fascinating. And, uh, I should ask you, since we're pre-recording this, how will you be celebrating, uh, Juneteenth this year? Well, I'll be talking, (laughs) I mean, I'll be talking, I'll be doing programs is what I, what I'll be doing. And I'll probably try to find some red soda water to drink. Uh, can't, I won't barbecue. I live in an apartment, so that's not a, that's out. Uh, maybe we'll purchase some. I mean, that's what we typically do. We try to have some commemoration of it in, in that way. But uh, uh, yeah, but for the most part, I will be talking about Juneteenth on Juneteenth. Annette Gordon-Reed, uh, the book is on Juneteenth. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. Hell yeah. I'll tell you what I want to do is I want to welcome back to the program, the co-host of This Is Revolution podcast. Um, still connecting to the audio. Yeah. Also, just a great oh, writer. Uh, definitely connected. Jason Miles, are you there? I am. Oh, the reason I have no camera. Okay, yeah, so, oh, I'm like a go. voice in the vo- in the void. Uh, let me see, for some reason. Yes, I see you. Can you see me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Jason, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Is uh, that a, a Conan the Barbarian shirt? This is a Conan the Barbarian shirt. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's pretty good. I thought it was a Conan O'Brien shirt, but nevertheless. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, uh, if, I, if I if I am wearing a Conan O'Brien shirt, there's a problem. I um, I don't know what what like what is your medium link? What is a uh, if I wanted to if I wanted to tell people to go uh, to your medium site, what would they do? Just go, go, Google Jason Miles Medium. Yeah, Jason Jason uh, Jason Miles. So I think, let me see. I have it right here. It's a uh, Jason Miles dot Medium dot com. Yeah. Okay. This piece I've been thinking about for six weeks, almost. Uh, you wrote in September, I was a teenage anarchist. Um, of course, also a, uh, uh, you know, a title of a song. Uh, but it, um, it's a great piece. And um, uh, it, 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 let's just start, and, I, and I've been wanting to talk to you about it and just try and find the right uh, time because it brings together a lot of sort of my, my uh, sort of fetishes over the uh, over the past um, 20, 25 years, uh, starting off with the Situationist, uh, which was oh, the okay. uh, the Situationist International, for people who don't know, came out of the sort of the Latrice uh, um, uh, uh, movement. And this um, uh, it was. I guess centered in France a little bit, but it was you know, throughout Europe. Uh, a guy named Guy Debord uh, was at least, uh, I guess, the the most uh, well known of them. And there was not many of them. There, there's many people who um, a, who attribute to them the '68 riots in Paris. And there was only, you know, uh, that uh, was was largely from them. And they developed all of these sort of like ideas of the spectacle. You can read Guy Debord's Society of the Spectacle. You watch a couple of his crazy movies, uh, which I still have on VHS from back in the day. Um, and you know about Malcolm McLaren being a part of that crew. Yes, and there was a there was a book called Lipstick Traces, uh, in which I actually there was a played version with um, uh, that guy Urbana uh, was 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 I think played Guy Debord in it uh, back in two thousand. The uh, went down there, and um, much of this I ended up sort of parroting a little bit in the movie called Bad Situation. So this this whole world, uh, I really. Um, find fascinating that that you start off with things like appropriating um, 
advertising messages and, and repurposing them. Uh, and the, the situation has had an idea about architecture and urban planning that was, um, and uh not much you know only guys like mike davis really got into uh stuff like architecture and urban planning when he writes um oh god i can't think of the name of the city book. of courts yes city of courts about about uh, california and then uh you know when you when you think about a guy like malcolm mclaren and you think about the sex pistols for me personally um and, and, I, and I don't know if you know this because I've, I've only interacted with you like this I, you were on Ben Burgess show and we were both guests and then Pascal and I were on. So you might not know, I actually am a musician. Me doing this show comes out of uh, something I wanted to do right before COVID. And then it was going to be something uh, we did. The band thought it was a dumb idea. <laughs> uh, uh, something we did when we weren't touring because I, I toured a lot. And um so that's where this comes from. So I actually lived in a, a warehouse in West Oakland. If you're familiar with the movie, Sorry to Bother You, a lot of that was yeah. uh, shot there. Um, but in this warehouse um, where these bands practiced and recorded, the Flipper was in there. Uh, the Dead Kennedys would come by so often. Faith No More is there. Then all the 80s metal bands are there. And then everything hip hop from the Bay Area is done out of there as well. So I kind of had um, my outlook on a lot of the things I see. And, and if you read the piece, a lot of it is really about the online left. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, you know, that was the sort of, the, that's a spoiler alert. It comes in and, and I was just reading the piece. I don't know how, I, 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 I can't remember exactly how I came across it. And I wasn't, I was just reading it from the perspective of, uh, of this, of, of looking at, the the relationship and you know so much of it is like sort of like a gen x sort mm -hmm. of centered type of 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 experience of of music and so let's go through that because i love the way that you you talk about this music in relationship to what was happening politically and then ultimately where we get to this idea of of both um of of it's deconstruction um and hold on let me get to my notes here it's a culture of deconstruction banging up against the culture of authenticity is where all this is leading mm -hmm. and um these are all very big issues for those of us who sort of we're in our 20s and in, you know in gen x in the 90s and the i mean i um uh let's i'll tell you what let's take it from uh, from Nirvana, because I remember when Nirvana came on tour with um, the the Nevermind album. This is the, this is the one that everybody knows, uh, or you know, I don't know. I guess everybody. I did I, I was obsessed <laughs> with it, even though I was born in. The, but the, the same weird year thing out, is, no, no, no. The same year he died. After we, that, we like the people I was friends with go down to see Nirvana at the Middle East in Cambridge. I played uh, the Middle East okay and so you know that scene there and there was like people were bummed because like we were listening to bleach which was their end but the idea that they were getting this level of of fame was really irritating to everybody and i was like I don't wait. No, why would we be, be upset about that? Like, like, wait, like, don't we want? And there was this sort of so. Okay, so work maybe backwards from that. Hold on for a second, brother, brother Cedar. Let's backtrack a little bit in this. <laughs> let's let's talk about before Nirvana, and you cannot have Nirvana without Black Flag, right? One thing I write in the piece that I'm probably going to get shit for as more people are going to read it now that I'm on the majority report is that I don't look at grunge as a genre more than a fashion aesthetic because genres tend to have a sonic through line. And a lot of those bands just happen to be from Seattle and they happen to be on sub pop, but there was really no similarity in sound because Alice in Chains, in my opinion, comes more from Van Halen and the hair metal scene of the eighties and maybe even Black Sabbath, then Nirvana, which is like, you know, that first wave of U.S. hardcore with bands like Flipper. I mean, Chris Novoselic goes off once Kirk dies and yep. joins Flipper and gets Flipper their first ever major label deal. Um, so 
when you look at bands that come from that first wave of hardcore, they are the American spawn of what they saw coming out of the UK. Yep. But the UK is <laughs> the derivative of what they were getting from the States with bands like the Dolls, the New York Dolls, the Ramones, television, et cetera, et cetera. And the UK gives you the visual aesthetic. And that's to me where the situationalist element comes into play. Malcolm McLaren knew how to sell spectacle. But one thing about the Sex Pistols that we don't really talk about when we talk about punk music, whether you like them or not, it, to me, isn't the point, is that it was accessible music. It's not that off-putting. There's songs you can sing along to. I mean, your show literally starts off with the last line they ever say as a band in, in my hometown San Francisco, you ever get the feeling you've been cheated because of that horrible tour where he had this great idea. I'm going to take the circus on the road in the middle of America. And those guys hated it. And they were also addicted to drugs. I don't know if you've ever been on tour with a drug addict. It's not a party. It's a nightmare. Right. I can't get dope in certain parts of the country. It's a bigger fucking nightmare. So now you got like dope sick dudes that are trying to drink themselves into playing and then you, you also mclaren took out people that could play in that band just to have the spectacle of sid vicious and that's why i do start it, it off with a quote from sid nancy you know i don't know if malcolm mclaren really said that shit in the studio but i think that really explains that so and we should, say, we should say about them that one thing that I find also interesting that was also a situation was that they were building in the critique mm -hmm. of them not being good musicians, yeah. uh, essentially. Like that was part of the package. You like, didn't need to be good, right? You're the antithesis of major 70s rock, which is kind of funny because we're in an era where major 70s rock is getting a bit of a comeback. What's that shitty band that everybody likes that sounds like Led Zeppelin? I can't think of their name. Um, they played at Coachella a few years ago and, and I worked there yeah. doing like number shit and everybody was all- Wolf Mother? No, that's another shitty band that sounds like other bands. They're, they're newer, I can't think of their name, but they sound like Led Zeppelin, like a total Led Zeppelin ripoff and everybody loved it. But there is, a, there is an element of classic rock that's even back in the quote unquote underground genres where people- Greta Van Fleet? Greta Van Fleet, yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. Just Greta it's... Bradley on that one, yeah. You, you hella made me remember that whole fucking Coachella. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's another topic for another time, Sam. Uh, the nightmare of an old man like me working young people festivals. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm um, not... Okay, Worse or better up. than when Sam thought your shirt was a Conan O'Brien shirt. Right. There you right. go. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's uh, one A and one B. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> um, sorry. Where, where, where were we? Sorry. Yes. Well, so you, I mean, we're we're talking about the 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 ha. the failure of the people in in Sex Pistols. The, 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 okay. The, the perception that they were bad musicians and well, no, the reality that okay. they were bad. Musicians. The, the, the musicianship didn't need to be there. Passion needed to be there, and so there's this culture with the fans of violence. Right, spitting on people becomes part of the show. That's weird to me. Um, <laughs> still, something that. I wouldn't say the spitting part, but violence that shows in these scenes that definitely live in the culture of deconstruction is still a thing. One of the last shows I played in a place called San Bernardino, California, there's a, there's a, there's a thing called crowd killing for these kids that do this thing called hardcore dancing, where even if people don't want to be a part of your mosh pit, they'll still fucking bring you in and hit you and shit like that. I think right. it's fucked up. And I said, when I got on, I was like, look, I'm not from around here. We don't play that shit. We will fuck you up if you try to, you know, started a whole conversation about it, which was kind of funny to do from the stage. <laughs> but that shit's just not cool to me. But that becomes part of the allure for some. And also, we're talking about 
a youth that is now not a part of any sort of movement. So we're the 60s from soul music to rock music to folk music is really about fighting these greater causes, racism, sexism, and the biggest one, the war in Vietnam. How many songs do we have from legendary artists from that era about the war in Vietnam, right? This is the common cause. And when we think about that era, what are the images that we think back to outside of Woodstock? We think of the girl putting the flower in the gun. We think of hippies against soldiers. Kent State, uh, uh, Kent State. all sorts of protest. Black and, Panthers. What do we by think the time we get to the 80s, there's no, there is no, um, and, 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 and to be clear, when we get, by the time we get to the 80s, we have also gone through the, at least in terms of the way society uh, told the story, that within the course of 10 years, there was almost this sort of like complete um, rejection of the yippie counterculture. And it was replaced with yuppies uh, by that point in the early 80s. And so there was just sort of like you were untethered as to if you were caught in between those two forces, it seems to me. Well, and a lot changes economically, right? Now we're starting to make this pact with China and we're moving factories overseas. And the economic opportunities that your parents just had to buy a home this is they're buying a home before the 30-year mortgage is a thing that's how cheap home buying is at this point in time they can not have a college degree or even a high school diploma and buy said home and raise a family now that is not your reality as a young man or woman in the in the 70s in the UK, especially once Thatcher comes in with crazy austerity politics and coming out of Carter's administration, which is maybe the beginning of the neoliberal era for a lot of people, Reagan poses a massive threat. And that becomes the rallying cry for this movement of American hardcore. And I, and I want to bring this up because I think we can't really talk about where Nirvana comes from until we talk about where their influence comes from and why Nirvana is really interesting to me. And where Nirvana is interesting to me is I did do a, some research in doing this. Um, I am friends with some of these artists from this era. And I also, uh, through doing my show and knowing a bunch of cool uh, rock and roll punk rock professors. There's more than, than you think there are out there. They were actually part of the scene that, that actually went to school with some of these bands and had, and, and started bands as well. Um, there was a few things that I wanted to ask them about the scene in particular. And my main question was about 84 being a seminal year because that's Reagan's reelection year. And that's the year they're defeated. And if you go back and look at the flyers from that era, there's some really great art um, from that era. And you listen to the music of that era, it's all anti-Reagan. And it's all about, you know, being mad at your conservative parents and not wanting to be part of the bourgeoisie that you are kind of born into. Um, you could pretty much call that music fuck you mom music if you really, <laughs> if you really wanted to. And 84, they lost. And then the music gets a little more violent. And the fan base gets a little more violent. It almost looks a little fashy. And there's a great documentary, and it's an awesome coffee table book called American Hardcore, which has some really beautiful imagery um, of that era, if you like that type of music. I think the imagery is beautiful in it. And the documentary is pretty interesting. If, if you just want to know about, you know, origins, of, of some of these bands and, and the music and what was making them want to want to do this stuff and how they were touring. But what happens is I think people get up, so caught up in what they think the story is about these guys that they're kind of projecting on them a leftist tendency that might not be there in everybody. And 
a lot of the article for me poses a question. Are these guys really trying to create something outside of the mainstream or were you just locked out of the mainstream? And this is kind of a cottage industry that's formed by you being locked out. By the time Nirvana comes to be, because remember, as Sam can attest, as everybody else that's on the screen that I see is <laughs> probably born in the 90s, as Sam can attest, these bands all had to like make their own flyers. There is no terrestrial radio. There is no online. It's so all college radio for a lot of these, these bands. College radio is king. I came up in an era where college radio was king. Um self-pressing was was huge because again people now can kind of record a record um on your laptop and you there's distribution sites that'll distribute it for you on every major platform before just getting to be able to record your music was the challenge so that's why the recordings from that era are really bad because you're talking about we had to sneak in at this time to do this da, da, da. and it becomes where the worse the recording, the more authentically real you are because it's all about energy. The germs to me are a perfect example of that. The germs. I don't know anyone that walks around singing germ songs. I'm not saying they're bad songs. It's just, they're really badly recorded. <laughs> they, they, you know, the singer died, I think after the first record, uh, sadly killed himself. And, uh, it's not that catchy. By the time Nirvana decides to sign a major label deal, you know, we always have to add that caveat. They signed a major label deal. I don't think anyone in that camp knew how big Nevermind was going to be. Because also they're coming out in the shadow of uh, not just hair metal. And I didn't really add this too much in the, in the piece, but you're also coming out of the shadow of an emergence of heavy metal. You know, bands like Metallica are going platinum. Uh, Megadeth are going platinum. Iron Maiden is a, is a huge stadium act. Ozzy Osbourne is a huge stadium act. And then you have the hair bands, which are kind of a, a more Reagan-esque, um, decadent um, catnip for, for suburban uh, mall youth at that time. So Nirvana's Nevermind, um, I'm sure they thought it was going to do well but they never thought it was going to do what, like 11 plus million copies influencing people like Emma Viglin, you know, years later. Well, we, and, and I feel like they also, there was an element, maybe this is just my own bias, but they, they were also a, um, came out of like the tradition of like Husker do and mm -hmm. the, replacements in particular like, I mean, the replacements for me was, that was it for me. Like I, the, and you know, and, and and sorry ma forgot to take out the trash is exactly like one of those albums like uh, like 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 literally like and, and they they're building into that critique right like this is this is the garbage that we actually put on and and i uh, i i mean I, i'm not sure how well they could all play frankly and certainly not after an entire bottle of vodka uh, you know could uh, like westerberg stay up on stage it seemed um and uh but it, 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 it felt like Nirvana was a sort of a hybrid of those sort of garage, that garage band post punk. I don't know how else to place the replacements in there. Um, and, and that sort of the, the, the metal on some level. I wouldn't necessarily call them post punk. I think they are a part of punk. I, I also equate, I, I've also played um, with a lot of those post punk bands. I'm talking like the first wave English late seventies bands um so i don't put them in that category because i don't think they are post-punk i think if anything they are the clinton <laughs> clinton punk if you will um but ultimately it becomes important music to the journalists that are writing about it and no matter what Kurt Cobain tries to do to shed this pop culture fame, it just becomes more and more marketable. It's, it's, you know, there's some Mark Fisher quotes in the piece because 
uh, Fisher actually wrote about Nirvana. He was a, a music journalist as well as a, a great writer with capitalist realism. And, and um, I think his critique of Cobain, the, the paradox of his, of his fame, that and drug addiction had a lot to do with his suicide because the thing about the culture of authenticity is you're constantly kicking people out, like you said earlier, that get a certain level of fame because they're not real. And we see it here as well on the online left, right? And these two cultures, the culture of deconstruction, which is basically just the culture of no, that's it. We had Vijay Prashad on our show one day and we were talking about the contemporary, mostly, mostly online left, let's speak realistic. And he goes, you just can't be no all the time. Mm. He said, you have to give people something to want to fight for. We've had Shahid Boot. I'm friends with Shahid Buttar. He's like, we've critiqued enough. We need solutions. This music doesn't give you solutions. It's not supposed to give you solutions because you have authenticity on one side and you have deconstruction on the other side and they're working hand in glove to pretty much keep the scene very, very small. There's really no infrastructure built in to, to propel anybody into the mainstream to try to deconstruct the mainstream because that's not really a goal. And, and no. I mean, uh, let's, uh, let's move into that, to that parallel with the online left, because this is where you, you sort of even take that turn. And, um, you know, like from my perspective, like with um, the squad, for instance, um, we're looking at politicians who uh, are bringing stuff from the outside into the the halls where there's institutional power. And of course, that's going to mean like you got to do the music video that MTV like, you know, like to sort of like cross it. They're going to do that, that, that video. And that is, they're, they're doing that music video so that they can expand their, their, their base and, and, and bring that, that music to a different audience. Um, I mean, that, that to me feels like what, you know, where, where we have been at and on some level, those people who were pissed about, uh, never mind that I, you know, down at the middle East, that it was getting so much attention, um, that that's sort of the stage that we've been in since bernie's lost in 2020 on some level which is like let's just tear it down for the most part and and if it's not it that we're tearing down it's just like let's train that fire all around us on some level and nothing's being constructed and nothing like you know I, I think there's been a massive failure by uh, the 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 Democratic leadership, let's say, for pushing a lot of these, uh, you know, in the, in the way that they tried to sell this big bill. But there was been a shocking absence of any type of organization, not just with the online left. I think like sort of broadly speaking of like, where are the people advocating for? I mean, free community college is not free college, but it's free community college. Where are the people advocating for parental leave? Where are the people... <laughs> Like, where this is this gets, happening? This gets into deconstruction, right? Because then you hear people say shit like this. How many times have you guys said this? And, and Matt, please jump in if, if, you, if you hear me on this. It's not enough. A little social democracy in America would go a long fucking way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Please don't call me a reformist. I'm just being realistic. When I was working a regular job before the fame and riches of podcasting, <laughs> I worked with the unhoused. A little bit of social democracy goes a long fucking way. When Gavin Newsom goes, and it wasn't his decision because he was sitting in a room and figured, I, I figured it out. When he got pushed by activists to use vacant hotels to house homeless people, you got the COVID numbers down. We got to house people in their own individual units with their own showers. Were there problems with it? Hell yeah. Did I have to fucking stop dudes from beating the shit out of their women? 
Hell yeah. Did I see kids that had dropped out of school in the second grade that couldn't read? Hell yeah. There's problems. But the first step has to be the housing. But if I poo-poo the project as a massive failure, you know, it didn't work out as well in LA as it did in the Bay Area, then it's hard to get anything done. And, and how much of that too is just this internalized, I don't want to say trauma, but yeah, trauma, I guess, uh, throughout society that trying or working hard and, and taking these steps of progress, it, that's harder than just saying tear it all down. And it opens you up like emotionally and it opens your hopes up to something that might not work out and might let you down. And, and what happens when the machine and the machine in this sense is capitalism? How do you fight the machine when you, as, as, as my co-host who's been on this show, Pascal Robert says, there is no left in America. We have a bunch of leftists mm -hmm. and the left doesn't have enough power to pop a fucking grape. So what happens when you elect powerless people into state and federal office when there's no true infrastructure there to support them? There's no grassroots movements outside of maybe some sort of electoral movement to really push any sort of agenda. You, you will get consumed by the machine, right? Kurt Cobain could have stayed on Sub Pop. Nirvana could have stayed on Sub Pop. I don't know that they sell 11 million records with that exact same album, Nevermind, because remember that was done on Sub Pop. But... They break out into the mainstream and there's really no infrastructure there to support them other than the mainstream infrastructure. And even when we look at these cultures of authenticity in the underground, they're literally modeled off the, the bigger capitalist ones. Why, why does SST lose all those bands? Because they're not paying the fucking bands. You know who else doesn't pay bands? major labels right so as i'm watching people fight i'm asking myself is your fight a legitimate frustration or is it a brand exercise mm. because much like these bands from the 80s when the 90s hit and this genre called pop punk came to be Green Day, Blink-182. Maybe you can throw bands like Rancid in. And the, again, these are some people that I personally know. And I'm not saying this as a pejorative. But we, and, and I don't think they said, hey, guys, we're like punk, but like not frightening. Like, <laughs> I don't think that was their goal because to them, they are just like those 80s bands because those 80s bands come out of suburban nuclear families as well, right? But the fame that they get, because after Nirvana, you get Dookie, and it's like, dude, we can monetize rebellion. You start to get the blow up of Hot Topic stores where, Sam, I believe a teenage daughter. I do. I, I have a 23-year-old daughter, but I do have teenage boys. Um. And you also see you can, Kristen Cinema on a regular basis, right? She seems to shop at Hot Topic. Uh, no, that's uh, what's the older version? There's like an older version of Hot Topic. Wet Seal? I don't know. <laughs> Not exactly sure. Is Wet Seal still a thing? Uh, but but you know what I mean? Like you can get rebellion at Hot Topic. When I saw an Anarchy shirt for sale, I was like, "Word!" <laughs> that was something that you made. And when you even watch like, like Cobain made a flipper shirt, that was his favorite band, but he couldn't get one because they, they didn't mass produce merchandise. Those guys were all fucking dope fiends trying to just get to the next town. So when you see this stuff blow up and mall culture blow up and these original dudes are sitting by, they're like, punk is dead. F these guys. 
they're playing these big festivals. Warp Tour is a corporate festival. Vans is a major corporation. It's owned by another company. I can't think of the name off the top of my head. Please don't think there's some stoner in a garage making slip on checkerboard vans. They are, they are part of a major, major uh, multinational conglomerate. So these guys are seeing the aesthetic they created selling millions of records, playing bigger rooms. Eventually, they start getting on Warp Tour. Warp Tour's got an old fucking band stage. There's a name for it. I can't think of the name for it. You know. And now these guys are getting their own edition of Vans. There's a Bad Brains Vans edition, right? You can go into a Hot Topic right now with your teenage daughter, and she can go run to the anime slash hot topic band section and there is a section for sam cedar with minor threat shirts that you never got to get as, <laughs> as a young person <laughs> right it's, yeah, bill collector sorry um <laughs> well, that, i mean that that was like the i mean there's there's a there's there's, there's there, i mean this is a to a certain extent there's a situationist um you know this is the situationist uh, uh you know sort of like the, the the spectacle just absorbs everything uh ultimately and um these uh you know uh, there is no ability to sort of stand outside of it and there was this concept particularly around the the, the 90s i think it was when i remember i remember mort Saul actually talking about there is no selling out anymore it's just you're buying in um and you um there is no you can't you can't stand outside of that 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 machine on some level and then it becomes largely a, a branding exercise because you don't know how to both um express the frustration but you also like know like well i want somebody to hear me express my frustration so i've got uh, i'm gonna play in a room full of people look man you did comedy. You ever yep. done comedy for the bartender? Well, <laughs> yeah, actually, I did for a very long time. In fact, that's that probably sucks. Well, and you have your friends with David Cross. David Cross is one of my favorite comedians. If it wasn't for David Cross, I wouldn't even know that this show existed. I saw David Cross in this show hella years ago, and I was like, "Oh, this is his comedy review show." And I found out it wasn't. But there was many times I performed comedy for the bartender and David Cross, and <laughs> Phil uh, Cross uh, would would just like literally physically mess with me on stage to impress the bartender, and that was basically it. I mean, there was maybe four or five other people. Get more free drinks, right? I mean, it, you already are given. But the point, but the point being, at one point, that becomes unsatisfying. <laughs> right like at one point it, you need to you need to have an audience in front of people and and the thing is when you get to a certain point there's a great interview uh for people watching the show there's a really good interview with henry rollins in like 86 it's somewhere in the middle of the country i want to say he's in like dearborn michigan and the kid interviewing them after the show is basically trying to say are you guys sellouts now because you grew your hair long and you slowed the music down so around the record, this record called My War by Black Flag, the most punk rock thing they can do is like slow shit down. We're going to grow our hair out, partially because why the fuck not? We're always gone. We don't have time to fucking look cute for you. <laughs> and Rollins is kind of a douche in the interview to this, this young kid. But it's, again, that culture of authenticity, like, oh, you sold out now because you played in front of, you know, maybe a few thousand people, which isn't that big when you think about it, because that was the max that those guys really got. They never played arenas. Right. Never. And it's, it's, it's real interesting as Rollins is kind of trying to make the kids say, well, tell me why I'm a sellout. No, what about me is selling out? We're dirty. We have no money. And we're going to spend it trying to get to the next goddamn city. So what about me is selling out? And when you look at the online left 
and certain people are sellouts and this, that, and the third. It's like, well, why are they sellouts? What is making this person a sellout? Is it you don't like what they have to say? Is it that you think they're trying to get on MSNBC? Because I got bad news for people. That shit ain't easy to get on MSNBC. You can't just go down there and be like, I want to get on MSNBC. Right? You really need somebody who they want on to leverage you on. That's basically what happened with me. <laughs> I wanted Janine on and she said, I'll come on if Sam comes on with me. That's basically how I started my, my career to get onto that place. But that that's, happens very rarely. Very, very rarely. rarely. But it's, it's hella easy for people to call you a sellout for trying to get your message out to a broader audience. But it's also very easy to get co-opted by trying to get to a broader audience. And so why I brought all that stuff up about the 90s and pop punk is these bands that were saying punk is dead later start playing the corporate festivals. They start getting corporate endorsements. Some of them get major label deals. Some of them, if they had a little independent label, it got bought out by a major. So they are the facade that is the, the undergroundness of, of the major label that's running everything. And you start to ask yourself, are you raging against the machine? Or are you raging to be a part of the machine? Or does the machine just consume you? Yeah, I mean, I, my, my sense is, I mean, we don't have and we have not had a counterculture in this country since the 80s and i and i think i first sort of like um and maybe before then uh but 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 certainly i i saw it in the context of of you know or in the early 90s with this sort of rise of of independent film and i was a cassavetes fan and um i i realized just you know and i had done a very low budget film at that time and realized, like, even going around, um, that unless somebody's film had gotten bought, mm -hmm. I didn't care about it either. <laughs> like, 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 like my, and mine wasn't bought. And I was like, I, I know my, I, I mean, I, I knew it wasn't, you know, uh, a, a masterpiece, but I know, like, it was, it had some value, but there was no, there was no counterculture. There was no, place where this could be seen even at the festivals as the festivals became markets as opposed to exhibition you know like circuits of exhibition they became markets and i was like you know if i'm talking to somebody and they tell me their film hasn't sold after playing at two or three festivals my immediate reaction is can't be good it sucks good and even though i knew that like that was exactly the case with my movie uh at the time and i didn't think that my movie was garbage but i like would catch myself sort of having that immediate reaction because at one point and it was probably during the 80s um this concept of if it has no commercial viability it is not ha there is no there is no support mechanism there is no system in which uh, it can be valued because there was a time in our society where like um, there were infrastructures and support system mm -hmm. and, and, and compensation, not in the form of money, but in terms of like esteem or you could get you yes. could get famous you could, in circles. You could get a film made commercial success. You could show it. You could show it at bars and underground places and, and art houses you kind of see a little bit of that now, right? Because there is there's just a ton of film festivals for for everything. But on a, on a larger scale, let's let's pull back a little bit and look look at this from a larger scale again using pop culture. Two humongously successful movies, financially and critically, is Nomadland, which is a horrible take on a good book, and <laughs> and. Uh, uh, Parasite. Yeah. Snowpiercer, which is a very anti-capitalist movie by the same person that did Parasite, is a TV show. 
we can sell anti-capitalism well, it was a movie first, right? I mean, I, I have seen the movie. I, I don't know what the TV show's like, but I can't imagine that it's like more edgy than what it's, the, the- it's like the prequel, right? It's the story. Remember this the frozen people on the side and they're like, those were the big. But again, this is the most anti capitalism, ham fisted movie <laughs> around Snowpiercer, right? Yeah. Poor people in the back. They are the fodder for the engine. If I'm spoiling anything for you, that movie's been out for like five years. You should have watched it. Um, Parasite, another great movie about class and, and capitalism. The Joker, a very anti neoliberal movie where Batman's family are the villains. The rich people are the villains in this movie. And these are massive, major Hollywood productions. And, and again, and I bring this up because it's back to that machine situation. It, does it just consume you when there really is no infrastructure and there really is no vision to see how I can get through to the mainstream. Because of one thing about the culture of deconstruction and, and the culture of authenticity is it never has an, an entryway into the mainstream to deconstruct the mainstream so you can have your utopian uh, uh, world, right? And then you have so many people that have grown up in an era of reality television and branding that one of the main occupations that younger people want to have is influencer. Right. Have you ever been around a bunch of influencers? Shit sucks. Well, that, I mean, that is, I mean, there's some really good uh, writing about how uh, that was around, I guess, five or six years ago about um, the Facebook and Instagram essentially teaching people to commodify themselves um and and i mean to the point where now it almost seems like well yeah no of course like mm -hmm. <laughs> is that controversial and is what what's wrong with that um I, I mean to the point where like there wasn't there was a time almost probably less than a decade ago where that was sort of controversial do you really want to commodify yourself and get you know um uh, put yourself in the you know, I've earned uh, my uh, being has earned a certain amount of likes today. And, uh, you know, that that was um, uh, nuts. But all right. Well, listen, um, I, I, I would love to continue this conversation because um, it, 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 it fascinates me and I can't encourage people to read uh, your piece um, uh, enough. And, you know, maybe we can sort of like move on to the implications of where it leaves the online left even more. That, that's the next. That's the next piece uh, that I've, that I'm working on uh, because my my big fear is uh, I shouldn't say fear, but uh, what I'm starting to notice is that this is just a branding exercise. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that's all it becomes. What well, the online left or uh, yes? I mean, I think I think I think so much of it. The, you know, and maybe there's a certain inevitability. M my perspective on like what, you know, from and and I and I entered into it before it would, there was an online left. Actually, it was just uh, and was, I, I sent you, online. and I'll say this on air because I want to put you on the spot. I we did send you an email because <laughs> we want to get you on the show to talk about. Uh, oh. Yes, yes, I know. Your early, I, your early I, days yes. in Air America and the yes, idea yes. of, a, of a leftist uh, mainstream. Uh, yeah, I, I, I will do. I, I cannot tell you how, um, how, how far behind I am on, 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 <laughs> on such things. But um, I think that, like you know, the, the, what was at least in my mind when I entered in, and it was on, it was a different medium, and so there was. Uh, it functioned in a different way and it could function in a different way was to amplify uh people who didn't have access to you know i'm on m mass radio uh we're 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 on in la we're on in new york we're on in chicago we're on in miami and dallas um in in eight of the top 10 markets in the country and from chris hayes to glenn greenwald to uh to you know um to Chalmers Johnson, to whoever it was. It's like, we have the ability to actually amplify voices 
uh, that are important voices. And that was what our function was. But then when everybody is in on a platform where everybody has the same sort of like, you don't need 10 stations, you don't need a, a tower, you're also not going to reach, unless you're one of those rare people, you know, millions of people on a daily basis. Um, then it becomes like, well, what is the function of this? Um, you know, if you're not, how much are you going to be able to amplify people? And, and and if you're not a, able to amplify people, what is, how do you, like, you know, th there's a lot more questions to it, but w when are you going to be done with that piece, man? Um, I got it. I always run this stuff by Pascal. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's on, and I always have to run it by Tere Reed. So I have to, I have to run everything by those, the, the council of, uh, of great thought. And once the council approves it, uh, then I can, then I can post it up, but that is, that is the next, that is the next piece. Um, um, and also I have to get off these dating apps. That's really what's, what's happening right now. I hear you. I hear you in both. Maybe that'll be the third piece that you write and we can talk about that. We'll do the whole series. Um, we're going to put a link to your, uh, medium, uh, uh, piece, uh, Jason miles, um, can't can't tell you how much i really uh, appreciate this conversation and and the, and the piece itself i mean frankly um it, it really is uh, uh i found it really interesting uh, well, and of if course ever make it back to california during the plague um i will make it a point i'm not in the bay area right now i'm transitioning to uh move out of the country but i will make it a point to come back and take you to the studio in oakland and I guarantee whatever day we go in, you will see someone you grew up watching. Oh, that's awesome. Have a, we'll have a that. Folks, check out this uh, Is Revolution uh, podcast as well. Chase Miles, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I guess I'm where the choice is Option where you don't get paid for the road that bends before it finally breaks you. I guess I may have lost my drive between the 101 and the 5. Do you know how far the detail takes you? Yeah.